good morning, Christ Church, and all of our brothers and sisters that are, are joining us near and far who comprise uh, our Christ Church community. Uh, we are excited that you're with us this morning, and we're delighted that you've chosen Christ Church as your place of worship for this morning, uh, especially if you're a, a brand new face, um, if you're a, a guest or a visitor who are joining us for the very first time, uh, we're uh, we're grateful that you're with us this morning. Uh, for those who don't know, my, my name is Jake Steele. I'm the pastor of this church, and I'm, uh, I'm joined by a, a couple of others, our, our AV team in the balcony that we give thanks uh, for being here, uh, Judy Allison, our, our pianist and organist, and we have uh, Stephanie Gates with us, who's providing us um, some music, uh, uh, some accompaniment uh, this morning, and uh, we know that you're joining us from afar. You could have come to church, and so church is coming to you, and we're grateful you're joining us this morning, especially on this weekend, uh, this Memorial Day weekend, uh, where we are most appreciative of uh, our service, men and women who have and are living sacrificially, uh, all of those people uh, that are living a narrative that, are, that is larger than the individual, that is bigger than them, uh, and, and ensure us the freedoms that we enjoy. Uh, we're, we're acutely aware of our freedoms uh, this weekend, uh, especially now uh, in, a, in a season and in a stage where we've understood that those freedoms haven't been taken from us by force um, in as much as we, re, we, we relinquish some of them uh, by necessity. Uh, but alas, we're, we're appreciative of the freedoms that we enjoy now and every day. We celebrate those freedoms and we celebrate those uh, who are uh, in distant countries and faraway places that are uh, protecting those freedoms now. Uh, we recognize you and we give you thanks this Memorial Day weekend. Friends, as followers of Jesus, uh, those who bask in resurrective glory and hope with the gift of a new day, we know there is no more fullness of life. We know there's no more fullness of life that can be found outside the freedom and liberation afforded us in Christ Jesus, whose, whose name we proclaim and whose peace we possess. And, and friends, uh, I, I don't know if you're one who possesses that kind of peace. Uh, perhaps you're one who's relied on your portfolio to give you that peace. And if you're one who's relied on the Dow Jones to, to, to give you that peace, you understand that peace can, uh, can be diminished. Or if, you've won, if you're one who's relied on that type of peace uh, for your portfolio, that can, that can go away and that can decrease. If you're one who relied on your bank account uh, for, for your peace, we know that that can decrease. And if you're one who, who, who relies on popularity uh, for, for your peace, we know that popularity can diminish or fade with time. But if you possess the peace of Christ, the world can't take that peace away. Why? Because the world never gave that peace in the first place. And, and Jesus says, my peace I give to you, and my peace I leave with you. And I don't give peace as the world gives peace. You see, the peace of Christ abides with us, uh, not, not in the absence of conflict or chaos or confusion, but even in the midst of it. And so it's that peace that we proclaim and we embrace this morning. And in that peace, we're going to start our service and praise, glorifying the name of the Lord. So I'm going to ask wherever you are that you join me in song this morning. We're going to start uh, by singing, uh, glorify thy name. Thy name, glorify thy 
As pastor of this church, I, I, I make a practice of saying that you're welcome into this place. You know, it, it, it doesn't matter how it is that you got to this broadcast. It, it, it really doesn't matter the things that you're trying to trudge through uh, this week and maybe the previous couple of days. I have no idea of, uh, of your emotional, your spiritual, your mental or physical state. Uh, but, but we're bound un, under the name of one name and we raise that banner. Uh, of, of all things that fade with time. You know, the, the scriptures say that the, 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 the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. We stand on the steadfastness and promise of that word. And, and we're delighted that you're joining us this morning. And we glorify the, the name of the Lord. Now, whether, whether you're seasoned in your faith or you're just now starting in your faith, uh, our, our, our paths converge to one place in, in the sense that we all can recognize and, and, and celebrate or pay attention or accept the, the, the fact that there are three significant events in the life of Jesus. Wh- whether you're seasoned or you're starting, we can all pretty much accept that there are three significant events that underpin the life of Jesus. I bet you we could all name them. We can name those three significant events that underpin the life of Jesus. See if you can name them with me. The the, the first one is obviously the birth and the life of Jesus. There is the first significant event. Uh, Jesus' birth and his life. And then the second being, what would you say? His death. And, And then the third significant event that underpins our faith and our knowledge of Jesus is his resurrection. His, his birth and his life, his death and his resurrection. We have, we have Christmas, we have Easter, we have Christmas, we have the crucifixion, and we have Easter. And, and, and the funny thing about it is we can find cards for all three events. But, but, but we chronicle today um, another significant event that doesn't get a lot of airtime, and, and, and that is the ascension of Jesus. We're aware of Christmas, we're aware of the crucifixion, we're aware of Easter, we can find cards for all three of those events. I have shopped and I can't find an ascension card. Can anybody? Have you ever shopped for an ascension card? Have you ever seen a card that says happy ascension? No, it doesn't exist. We can't find it. Why? Because the ascension of Jesus doesn't get a lot of airtime. And I don't know if, if, if you're new to the faith or if you're seasoned in your faith, if you found yourself in a worshiping community that recognizes that recognize the, 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 the significance of the ascension of Jesus. Today we're going to canvas that. We're going to canvas the significance of the ascension. Maybe you've not spent a whole lot of time talking about it or thinking about it, but much like the original disciples, we don't know what to do with the ascension. We don't know what kind of relevance that has for us. But it has everything to do with us. Hear me. The ascension ascension is essential if we're going to understand or undertake an authentic life of discipleship. I'll say that one more time. The ascension is essential to understand if we're going to undertake an authentic life of discipleship. Think about that. Um, as we go into this word. Um, To this point, we've seen Jesus resurrected. He appears before his disciples in Mary Magdalene. Uh, Not not, not just the disciples one time, but twice when he reappears for Thomas. Gives an encore, uh, an encore arrival, an encore encore sighting 
just for Thomas. He comes back resurrected just for Thomas because the twin wasn't there when Jesus came. He appears to the ten first, then to Thomas and the rest of the uh, of the ten, and then as we uh, as we canvassed last week, uh, the third time when he had the private conversation with, with Peter. We see how it is that Jesus has spent some time with the disciples before this significant event of the ascension takes place. I want to bring you there. Uh, I want to bring you from the Gospels to the book of Acts. We see it as the Acts of the Apostles. If you turn, if you pull off the dust of your Bible at home and, and you turn to the, to the book of Acts, you'll see in the beginning, it's called the Acts of the Apostles. And indeed, it was the Acts of the Apostles. But before we see any of the Acts of the Apostles, what we see first is an act of God. And we'll, and we'll be examining that not only this week, but next week in our celebration of Pentecost. But let's go uh, to the first chapter of the book of Acts. I want to bring you right there. Hear these words that's coming to you uh, from the message. It says this, Dear, Dear Theophilus, in the first volume of this book, I wrote on everything that Jesus began to do and to teach, began to do and to teach, until the day he said goodbye to his apostles, the ones he had chosen through the Holy Spirit and was taken up to heaven. After his death, he presented himself alive to them in many different settings over a period of 40 days. In face-to-face meetings, he talked about he talked to them about things concerning the kingdom of God. And as they met and ate meals together, he told them that they were on no account to leave Jerusalem, but must wait for what the Father promised. The promise you heard from me. Jesus said, John baptized in water, but you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit and soon. And, and when they were together for the last time, they asked, well, Master, uh, Jesus, is now the time? Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? Is this the time? And he told them, you don't get to know the time. Timing is the Father's business. What you'll get is the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will be able to be my witnesses. You will. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem all over Judea and Samaria, even to the ends of the world. These were his last words. And as they watched, he was taken up. He ascended and disappeared in a cloud. And they stood there, staring into the empty sky. And suddenly, two men appeared in white robes. They said, you, you Galileans, why do you just stand here looking up at an empty sky? This very Jesus who was taken up from among you to heaven will come as certainly and mysteriously as he left. So we stop this morning. I feel living, rich, real, and relevant word of God for a people of God, and we say together, thanks be to God. I I want to speak to you. I want to talk on this specific subject this morning, what it means to be searching for a sign. What it means to be searching for a sign, because those disciples, as they stared into the sky, they were searching for a sign. And believe it or not, we live in a world that is searching for a sign. And maybe you, in the time and situation you find yourself in these most interesting and unique times, find yourself searching for a sign. If you're there, this word is for you this morning. I offer it to you, and I ask you uh, to join me in a word of prayer before we receive this word. Almighty God, feed us with this word. Not only feed us with this word, but fill us with this word to overflow it. And as a result of all of that, Lord, free us to live into this word fully. We pray it all in the name of Christ Jesus, your Son and our Savior. So for those of you who are joining us for the very first time, who may not have spent some time in the scriptures, you need to understand where we are. Because right away in the book of Acts, we, we see how it was that the writer, 
Luke is saying in, in the first verse, in, in the first book, Theophilus, I, I wrote to you about everything that Jesus began to do. You, you, you see, oftentimes we read the Gospels and assume that it's a finished work. But when Jesus conquered death and, and slayed sin, Jesus began a work in the disciples that continues through the church, through us. We, we see how it was that the, the Gospel writer Luke was responsible for the gospel of Luke, wrote that account to share everything that Jesus said and did during his three-year earthly ministry. And and then in the second version, in the next next account, uh, wrote uh, to to either this person named Theophilus, or or perhaps Theophilus stood for an entire body of people, more like the term friend. But, But in the first book, Theophilus, I wrote to you, all that Jesus began to do and to teach. And, and, and this is Luke's this is Luke's second version. Uh, the, the book of Acts, uh, most scholars attribute to the same one who wrote the, the gospel of, of, of Luke. And Jesus, Luke says, in, in the book of Acts, spent 40 days with the apostles who he had chosen. He spent 40 days with the disciples before this dramatic event that they see that they had seen witness in his ascension. Now, I think it's important to point out that 40 is a significant number. As you catalog scripture, you turn the pages of scripture, you see that 40 is a number that repeats itself throughout the biblical witness, throughout scriptural history. From the beginning, in the book of Genesis, which means the beginning, we see how it is that the Lord uses 40 as a number or as a period of time that, that, that God reforms and reshapes and refashions or, or recreates and does something brand new in and through the world. We see it from the beginning uh, when the world turned its back in covenant relationship with God. Uh, there was a fall in the beginning when we thought that we could go our own way. Uh, and, and as a byproduct of our vertical relationship with God, uh, breaking, uh, everything in the horizontal changed too. And, and we see in, in, in the beginning in Genesis how it was that God spoke to, to, to a man named, named Noah and, and his family and said, Noah, I, I'm going to work and, and come in relationship with you. The, the, the world has turned away from me and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flood the world with, 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 with flood waters and I'm going to start over working in and through you. And so it was that, that, that Noah and his family, in faithfulness to God, in a time when nobody expected it, in a period of drought, constructed this boat. And everybody laughed because Noah was creating or constructing this ark, this boat that was going to float on water when there hadn't been rain in years. And, and Noah tried to send out a reprimand to the world to say, repent, turn away, uh, uh, to turn away from your wicked ways, and God's going to do something brand new. But alas, Noah boarded the, the, the ark with, with the animals and his family, and God uses that as a, as a frame uh, through which we see that God uses a period of 40 days and 40 nights to, to reform and to refashion and, and to recreate and do something brand new. And that number repeats itself in Exodus when another leader uh, rises up uh, to free the people in Egypt, the Hebrew people. And, and, and it, was, it was there that Moses delivered the Hebrew people out of slavery. Uh, from, uh, from what was cert- short, certain death, from imprisonment to promise. And, and what should have taken 40 days took 40 years for the Hebrew people to finally find the, the, the promised land. Uh, and, and in between, in between, it was Moses who went up Mount Sinai and established covenant relationship with God. And God says, if I'm going to be your God, you're going to be my people. This is the covenant that I'm establishing. And, and, and and Noah, or not, not Noah, but Moses was on Mount Sinai for 40 days and for 40 nights to receive the commands because God was reforming and reshaping and renewing and recreating a people, preparing them for something brand new. So they would enter into a land flowing with milk and honey. Fast forward through time and go to the New Testament uh, and into the Gospels, and we see how the Word was made flesh in the fullness of time, and His name was Jesus. And when He started His three-year earthly ministry here, the Spirit 
prompted him to go out into the desert, and there he was tempted by Satan in every way that we're tempted, and he spent a, a period of what? 40 days and 40 nights, because through Jesus, the Lord was recreating and renewing and restoring and doing something brand new. And when Jesus conquered sin and death and appeared before the disciple was risen, he had stayed with them and was teaching them and instructing them over a period of no less than 40 days and 40 nights, because Jesus was preparing them for something brand new that they didn't quite understand. And so after the period of 40 days and and, and 40 nights that the Lord appeared to those disciples was risen, he took them out as far as Bethany, Scripture says, and and, and there did something incredible. He, he, He ascended. But before he ascended, the disciples were were kind of perplexed. They were they were asking they were asking Jesus a question. They they, they said, Lord, is now the time? Is now the time that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Is 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 now the time that you're going to make good on everything that we thought you would do? Is now the time that you're going to make good on everything that we used to have? Is now the time that you're going to do and be everything that we envisioned and dreamed you'd be? And, and, and even then, they, they were still looking at the Lord in their own lives through such a limited lens. And as I studied this week on the ascension, the events surrounding the ascension, in that time that they, they, they saw Jesus be lifted up and disappear into the clouds, I, I thought to myself, how much of the disciples are in our DNA? Because we ask similar questions. At the end of the day, how many of our prayers have paralleled their petition? Lord, it's been at least 40 days. Is, is now the time? Is now the time that you're going to restore or repair life as we dreamed that we'd have it before everything fell apart? You know, our, our, our questions, our petitions are the same as theirs. They said, Lord, is now the time? We say, Lord, is now the time that you're going you're gonna to redo or repair life as we dreamed it before all of this kind of fell apart for us, this pandemic? Lord, is now the time we'll finally be able to recoup and thus rejoice because we've been able to revert to life as we knew it? Remember last week, we were in a discussion about how we're so inclined to, to go back to normal, to want to go want to go back to normal, that our default is to revert. And in the life of Peter and his interaction with Jesus, uh, in so many ways, teaches us not to pray to God to go back to normal. And, and I know that there are components of normal that were necessary in life-giving for us. But, but, but through the lenses of Peter, perhaps we've learned to pray to the Lord not to go back to normal, but to look forward to better. And it's kind of a continuation of that. But so much of, our, of the disciples is in our DNA. We, we, we pray for the same things. And, and, and the disciples say, wait a second, Lord. We're having a hard time understanding. How is it that you can establish a kingdom here if you're leaving to establish a kingdom in heaven? They didn't understand, brothers and sisters, that, that, that it was that kingdom as it was in heaven, that Jesus wants to establish here on earth as it is in heaven. Isn't that what we pray in the Lord's Prayer? Lord, your your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. They said, Lord, when are you going to do it? When are you going to be and to do everything that we anticipated that you would do and to be is now the time that you're going to restore and repair everything we thought we would have before everything fell apart. And we're right there with them. The scripture says, all of a sudden, Jesus ascended. He, he ascended, and as he ascended, they were astounded. And, and as, as he ascended, they stood staring, stood staring at an empty sky, searching for a sign, <laughs> be, be, because
because their experience of Jesus wasn't what they expected. E even then, they, they were still looking at their Lord and their own lives through such a narrow lens. They were thinking still in such physical terms, but Jesus wanted them to do so much more. Could it be, brother or sister, that, that we look at ourselves, our relationship with the Lord through such a narrow lens? That, that even now, when a time is chaotic and confusing in, in, in ways that we can't see, the Lord wants to do so much more than we could befuddled them is oftentimes what confuses us. And it's this. The, the Lord had to depart from the normal. The Lord had to depart from the norm in order to impart something new. Jesus had to, to help them to depart from what they thought was going to be the normal as a means of imparting something brand new to them that they couldn't expect and they didn't see. It, it, it could it be, brother or sister, watching online that as much as we want to go back to normal, as much as we want to revert, as much as we want the Lord to, to revisit or repair or restore the things that we thought we would have before everything fall, fell apart, could, could it be that, that the Lord has to put us in a place where we have to accept a departure from the Lord? something new. He was departing in such a way as a means of imparting something they couldn't see or comprehend. I, I, I think at a point of a, a praise, brother or sister, to, to understand that, that, that God is still sovereign, that God is still in control, even though we can't see, we can't expect or anticipate that the Lord is still moving, even though we can't see. That there's, there's, there's a plan in place even though we're perplexed, that, that even though our plans might seem to be falling apart as it was for the disciples, the Lord is moving in a way that we may not be able to see, yet is still sovereign enough to show us that in time, for those of us who abide, that, that, that our reality can be so much bigger than we thought it to be. So Jesus ascends, and as he ascended, they were astounded. See, get this, brother or sister. The, the, the disciples assume that, that Jesus' physical distance meant, meant that, that, that there was going to be an absence of his presence, which was logical. It's logical to assume that somebody's physical distance meant the absence of their presence. The, the, they thought that, that Jesus, as they searched for a sign in the sky, they thought the very presence of Jesus had expired. They thought his presence had expired because they could no longer see him as they saw him. And maybe your relationship with the Lord has changed to, to such a, a, a point where maybe a, a, after a short or long period of time, you no longer see the Lord as you saw the Lord before. They could no longer see him as they saw him. They assume that the longer the distance, the less of his presence. But, but, but look at this. Look at this. If you're, if you're getting up from the computer or you're leaving and going to the kitchen to get yourself some breakfast or some Cheerios, I don't know what it might be, stop for a second because I want you to look at this. What Jesus was trying to teach them was that in ascending, his presence would Could it be in this most uncertain, confusing, and chaotic time that we shouldn't could conceive the presence of the Lord to be lost, but really just kind of changing locations, changing, changing ways that we had previously conceived? Look at this. This is something I observed as I studied this week. Oftentimes we make the mistake of conceptualizing Jesus' ascension spatially in terms of proximity. But that's only a part of it. They saw Jesus ascending as a spatial problem because his proximity had changed from where he was to where he would be. And, and the disciples were stopped. They stopped. They were dead. They were befuddled. 
uh, staring into the sky, confused, searching for a sign because they assumed that Jesus' ascension, that his physical ascension mean a loss of his presence. And often they make the mistake of assuming that the, the ascension of Jesus was a spatial issue in terms of proximity, but that's only a part of it. And only thinking about that one part, all of us can ascend essentially. Picture this hypothetically. Picture this. Let, let, let's say, and I can, I can only think of a, a, a few couple of places where, where there is still a, a king or a queen that has a throne. You know, picture this hypothetically, that you or I as a tourist went to England. That, that I, I assume there's still a, a king, a king, uh, a, a king, a king's or a queen's throne in, in England. But let's just say that we made, we, we made attempts to bypass security, and we did. We could successfully ascend to the throne. We, we could uh, uh, ascend in terms of proximity where we were to where we are. Anybody could ascend, who, 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 who could bypass security, someone could uh, ascend a physical throne. But that's only a change in proximity. I can ascend the throne of England, but all I have done is to change my proximity to you. That says nothing of my authority. All I've done is to simply change my proximity. It says nothing of my power. There hasn't been a change in power. Why? Uh, b- because that power has to be conferred. That that I, I can't I, I can't have a power that was never granted me in the first place. So I can physically ascend. The disciples thought that Jesus has physically ascended, but anybody can ascend spatially. I don't want us to think so much of this as space travel. In as much as I, I want us to understand that by ascending, Jesus not only changed his relationship uh, by, by way of proximity, but changed his relationship to them by way of power. That it wasn't so much a spatial change in as much as it was a relational change. See, if I ascend to the throne of England, all I've done is to change my proximity. I have not changed my power. But, 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 but in ascending, something dramatic happened. The disciples were caught staring into the cloud searching for a sign because they assumed the ascension of Jesus meant that he becomes spatially distant. But Jesus had to become spatially distant as a means of becoming relationally close. They couldn't see it at the time. But Jesus became spatially distant as a means of changing his relationship to and in a way, Jesus' spatial distance had to happen. He had to depart from the norm in order to impart something new, which was a brand new kind of relationship that he, that he went further away as a means of moving closer to the Father. And we see that in John, especially in the disciples. sisters, here's why the ascension of Jesus was so essential. Now, I've given us a lot of information to try to connect the dots that we're now. Here's why the ascension of Jesus is so essential. It did not mean, contrary to the disciples' understanding, it did not mean that his presence and his power had expired in as much as his presence and his power had been exchanged. says in the Gospel of John, I am going away, but where I'm going, you cannot come. And they say, we don't know where you're going, Jesus. Show us the way. And it says, I am the way. Do you not know that I've been with you all this time, that, that, that I am the way? I am going to go away, but I'm not going to leave you orphaned because I am coming to you. I've got to depart from what you do. I've got to put you in a position where you understand you're departing from the norm as a means of imparting something to you that is brand new. I've got to separate you from 
what you used to know in order to prepare you for something that you don't know. And in a way, separation was preparation. Could, could, could it be that our time of physical separation, the Lord is using it for, a, for, for preparation to do something brand new in and through us? To depart from the norm in order to impart something new? Jesus says, look, me ascending doesn't mean that my that my presence or my power has exited or, or, or that it's expired. No, I'm just exchanging it from me to you, from a heavenly place to an earthly place, from on high to below. There's a grand exchange that's going to take place. It's going to be exchanged unto you. Contrary to what the disciples thought, the ascension of Jesus wouldn't necessitate less of his presence, but it would detonate it. Why? Because at that point, the physical Jesus could only be at one place in one time, but in his ascending to the right hand of the Father, to the place that he was before all began, before the Word became flesh, who was God, who was with God, before it became flesh in the fullness of time. By ascending, Jesus would detonate more of his presence, not to one body, but to many bodies. You get it? That's why the ascension of Jesus is so essential. That, that, that his presence or his power would, 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 not be, would not be expired, but would just be exchanged from one body to the other. Remember Jesus' conversation with Mary Magdalene at the tomb? Mary Magdalene was one who, who tried to hold on to him. She tried to embrace him, and I'm sure that's what, she, that's, what, that's what she wanted to do. This was the Jesus that she knew in a way that she didn't recognize. But when she recognized him, when, when, when he called her name and she knew that it was Jesus, she went to embrace him. And Jesus says, don't hold on to me, Mary, because I've not yet ascended to my God, my God, to your God, to my Father, and to your Father. Touch wasn't the issue because of Thomas and Jesus says, look at my scars, look at my hands, touch my side, uh, put, put your finger in the nails of my hands. Touch wasn't the issue in the case of Mary. But he says, Mary, you can't hold on to me. Not because holding on to me is some uh, mysterious wall that you're keeping me, that you're keeping me from floating up into to heaven like a helium balloon. It's not a spatial issue. It's a relational issue. He says, Mary, if you hold on to me now, you'll prevent yourself from realizing my presence in a more powerful way otherwise. Don't hold on to me because in letting, in letting me go, you'll have no more of my presence. Because as it pertained to your ancestors, the way they understood God was to live among them. I will pitch tent. I will build for me a tabernacle and my presence will be among you. And that, and that presence morphed to, to, to Emmanuel, not just God among you, but, but, but Mary, as, as the way that you've recognized me as Emmanuel, not God among you, but God with you. But I'm going to change the state of that presence, not spatially, but relationally. You understood me as Emmanuel, God with you. But now that's going to come even closer to not, not God among you, not God with you. No matter what hell you go through, no matter what difficulty uh, that you might experience, no matter what chaos or confusion, that in, in spite of that, I'm closer to you than I've ever been before. Not because I'll be with you, but because of the comfort of the advocate that I've sent you. That's power. That's power. stop staring into the sky and was looking for a sign and how the Lord was moving their experience of what was different made them what they expected 
just before ascending, Jesus said, uh, Jesus says in the Gospel of Luke, in, in the first volume of this book, Jesus says in the Gospel of Luke, verse 24, verse 40, 44, um, he says, as he ascended, he says that, that when, when he was risen, uh, he, he, he came to them and said, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. And, and then Jesus opened their minds to the scriptures. Jesus says that everything that is written about me, the word that you examine in the Torah and all of the scriptures, that, that everything is written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and, and, uh, and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Everything that, 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 that you have seen written had to be fulfilled in me, in me. Th- then he opened their minds to understanding the scriptures. He opened their minds to understanding the scriptures. He said, look, when I was with you, you have to understand that everything that you see canvassed in the word, in the law of Moses, in the prophets, in the Psalms, everything in that, 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 that scriptural history was about me. All of those scriptural events were there to forecast what I had come to fulfill. All of it's a story about me. In other words, that scriptural history is my story. It's not something that you have to live up to. You can't live up to it. You can't live up to the things of Moses. You can't live up to the law of, of, of the, the things of, of Abraham. You can't live up to being David. I have come to fulfill all of that. All of those events have, have, have come to for, forecast what I, was, what I have come to fulfill. That history is my story. And my story is something that I want to You don't have to do anything but to have faith in who I am. You don't have to do anything but to have faith in the things that I have fulfilled that the Scripture is forecasting. I completed the work. I didn't abolish the law. I've come to fulfill it. That history is my story, but guess what? There's going to be a divine exchange. My story will be yours. My story. that you live in the letter of your life and with your lips will be my story. So to summarize this up, at the ascension, there, 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 wasn't, there wasn't a loss in power or presence. There, there, there wasn't, there wasn't a, an expiration of Jesus' presence and his power. It was just going to be exchanged from one body So anyway, he says, my power and my presence won't expire, but it will be exchanged, and you'll be my examples. You'll be my witnesses. And so in the beginning, the disciple says, the disciple said, Lord, it, it is now the time? Lord, when will you? In so many ways, Jesus says, no, when will you? <laughs> the disciple says, Lord, when are you going to do it? And, the, and Jesus says, no. When are you going to restore the kingdom? Jesus says, when are you going to establish it here? The disciple says, Jesus, you're going to do it. And Jesus says, no, you're going to do it. My power and my presence will be exchanged and you'll be my examples. You will be my witnesses. You will receive power. You will receive the life that was in me because I will be in you. You'll be my witnesses. I thought to myself, why is them fallen, failing, mistake prone, bumbling, stumbling disciples? Why them? Why, why us? Why, why someone who could screw it up so easily? Because, brother or sister, flip the page of the scripture and you see that the least like you are oftentimes the most like them. Not because we're so great, we just simply we're just simply the billboard displays that people see that says it couldn't have been from them. There must be a power within them that is not their own. Greater is me. 
Way greater is he that is in me than, than he that's in the world. You will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses. You will be my examples. You're, you're, the, you're the least likely, but I'll take the least likely to show the world that you can love the most like me. Just because the witness is small, brothers and sisters, doesn't mean it isn't significant. I want to close my time by uh, sharing a story that Max Lucado um, tells in, in one of his books. It's a story about this little boy named Blake Rogers. And, and, and Blake Rogers was a kindergartner, and he had a friend named Mara, and, and, they, and they share a kindergarten class. And, 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 and story goes per Max that, that Mara started to hum in class. She started humming in kindergarten class, and her teacher appreciated the music, he says, but he told Mara to stop. Now, it's not polite to hum in class, and she couldn't. The, the, the song just needed to be hummed in her head. It demanded to be hummed. And after several mornings, the teacher took decisive action. Now, she moved Mara's clothespin from the green spot to the dreaded blue spot. Moved it from green to blue. This meant trouble, and this meant a trouble Mara. Everybody else's clothespin, the story goes, hung in the green, and Mara was blue all by herself. Blake, her friend, tried to help. He patted her on the back, and he made funny faces, and he offered some comforting words, but nothing worked. Mara still felt alone. And so Blake made the ultimate sacrifice. Making sure his teacher was watching, he began to hum. And the teacher warned him to stop, and he didn't stop. And so she had no choice but to move his clothespin from green, out of the green, and into the blue. Blake smiled, and Mara stopped crying. She had a friend, and Max says, and we have an example. The story, the story goes on to say that Mara said to Blake, Blake, you, you didn't have to. Sunday school teacher, Mara, my, my Sunday school teacher tells me that when you're blue, Jesus finds a way of showing up and helping. I figured to keep me company before he gets here. <laughs> I, I, I figured that I would keep you company before, and, or I would keep you company until he gets here, church. That's what it means to be a witness. That's what it means. Disciples were staring blankly into the sky, searching for a sign. And two men in white robes, two angels said, Men of Galilee, why are you standing looking up here at the sky? We tell you the truth that this Jesus, this, this Jesus who you saw ascend in, in, in the same way, that you saw him ascend will descend in the same way that you saw him ascend. Max marks the spot, and guess what? You will be the examples right here where you are. Don't stare into the sky searching for the sign. It's going to happen. same one that ascended will descend, and you're going to be the examples. You're going to be the witnesses. You're going to be, you're going to be the billboard that screams right where you are. The presence and power of a risen Lord hasn't expired, it's just been exchanged, and believe it or not, brothers and sisters, we're called to be examples to all the Maras of the world who are searching for a sign. Could it be, could it be, brothers and sisters, that the sign could be closer than you think? Maybe in the, in the reflection of the mirror. Be the example. Be the example. You might think that you're unimpressive, but just because it's unimpressive, 
doesn't mean that it's not important. Just because the witness might be small doesn't mean it isn't significant. We live in this body that God is in with you. The presence and power of the Lord hasn't exited the people. It, 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 hasn't, it hasn't expired. It's just been exchanged from one body to the other. You are examples. Let's rest the Lord. Friends, we want to uh, close out our service with a time of prayer, but as a means uh, of putting us in a position uh, for that prayer time, uh, Stephanie's going to play. And I, I'd like you to use this musical space as a means of preparing your heart with whatever you're navigating, with whatever you're going through, whatever you're experiencing, whatever the previous week or this week has held for you, whatever this weekend and Memorial Day means for you. Open yourself to the movement of the Lord. Maybe you're searching for a sign. Maybe your experience of the Lord has gone beyond your expectation. Trust in this prayer time to release the things of you so that you could receive the things of the Lord. I'm going to invite uh, Stephanie to come and play, and then I'm going, to, I'm going to close us out in prayer. Use this as a time to prepare yourself, to, 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 to communicate, to be in conversation with your risen Lord and, and can see the way that he can only bring comfort but can bring you a different perspective.
it's so unlike those original disciples, those original apostles who you call them. Because each of us in some compartment of life have found ourselves in similar situations where we too have stared up at the sky, searching for a sign of your presence, searching for a sign of your assurance because our experience of you hasn't matched our expectation. And Lord, we find ourselves in chaotic and confusing and uncertain times, uh, times of our life we feel frustrated or, or afraid where the future seems unclear, where just where those original disciples found themselves. Well, Lord, could it be that, that in these confusing times, that you, you, you may not have caused it, but you're certainly using it as a space to put us in a position where you're helping us to depart from what we do in order to impart something that we do. That, that our separation from the rest of the world, maybe our isolation is served as a means to, to prepare ourselves to assume a posture that we, that we hadn't previously. But we know that your, that your love for us is great, that your intention and your will for us is good. We recall the world and, and, the, and the word and, and, the, and, the, and the prophetic word, Lord, that, that you know the plans that you have for us, plans not to harm us, but, but plans for good. A, a plans for a hope and a future, an expected end. Lord, we too are, are like those disciples who stare up at the sky, maybe with tear-filled eyes, waiting on some sign of assurance. And Lord, we live in a world that's also searching for a sign. Help us to understand on this path of faith that the signs are closer than we think, that your presence and your power uh, ha haven't haven't been extinguished. They haven't exited. They haven't, that your, that your power and presence haven't expired. It's just that your presence and your power has just exchanged bodies. That because of your ascension, we can prepare for your descension in us, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. That no matter what we experience, that you seek to come so close that we can never lose. So faithful, we are abiding presence in us. So, Lord, whoever we are, and whatever we're experiencing, and whatever we're going through, for however long we've gone through it, we ask Lord, that you create the space of prayer for us, maybe for the very first time, to release unto you what we need to release, to give unto you the things that we need to give, to make space for you to give unto us the things that you wait. instruction to the disciples was to wait where we were until we receive power to be witnesses. Well, Lord, our waiting isn't passive. We don't sit like bumps on a log. But we, like the disciples, actively create a space where we can worship to be in your word, to praise your name, to serve you actively, so that our waiting is an expression of our faith in you to understand that as we search for the sign that we could be closer than we think because you are closer than we think. Have your way among us, Lord. We pray over all the names and situations that we give unto you collectively right now for your care and your keeping. And we pray over all of them in the name of your risen and ascended Lord in Christ Jesus as he taught us to pray so. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And Lord, forgive us our trespasses as we, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power. Uh, you'll see uh, the, the words uh, before you. It is, uh, yes, thank you. Hail the day that sees him rise. On this Ascension Sunday, 
uh, this Memorial Day weekend. Will you stand and, and join me? Or stay seated if you so choose. I don't know. I won't be able to tell. But we're going to worship together. We're going to sing together to close out this time. Hail the day that sees the Lord. Hail the day that sees him rise, alleluia, to his throne above the skies, alleluia, Christ the while to mortals give, alleluia, free of sins his native sister, leave this place. Leave wherever you're at with this word of assurance, this benediction, this sending forth. There is a world around us searching for a sign, a, a reassurance, a hope, a ray of light, some confidence, some longing. By virtue of the way you choose to live and to love and to give, help a waiting searching for a sign to understand, contrary to their assumptions, that the presence and power of a risen Lord that has been inspired has just been exchanged to those of us who are willing to be able to see it. You are the Lord's witness. So wherever you work, wherever you give, whatever you do or say on this day and this week, as a guest, and you're wondering, yeah, since you're in the community and willing, and, 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 and you're in wheeling, when will we reconvene to face-to-face worship? Um, our relaunch team has projected the first portion of July as that date. You've received that in your memo. Please do us a favor. Uh, fill out that, that poll, either electronically or physically mail it in. 
um, so that we can have some data about how it is that we prepare and how we respond as we anticipate July. But until then, be sure to join us this time, this place, next week, as, as your pastor, as a spiritual guide, as a brother in Christ, as we abide with you and look forward